So, uh, this is Molly DeBlanc. She's one of my favorite people to work with on stuff. Um, uh, we decided to tackle this topic because uh, we really care about seeing the free software movement uh, be successful for a long, long time. And we talk about these things, like what makes a movement successful. And um, one of the things that we identified for like long time successful movements is that they tend to be intergenerational. So that there's an unbroken line taking the ideas of the movement from one generation to the next. So uh, Molly is young and I'm old, so we're going to talk about this topic together. I'm not young anymore. She's lying. <laughs> it's not true. It's all relative, I guess, right? It, it is relative. I, I have you some do notes if you want some notes. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> we're, we're well, we're well functioning with this. Uh, we made this hashtag. You can use it if you want. You can also tweet at us. Uh, Twitter is a super important part uh, of success within technology and free software and actually just a lot of things these days. Uh, so feel free to tweet. It's just cool. like the kids do. Or are they Snapchatting? Uh, I don't know. What did the president say during her opening? We're, they Snapchat. They Snapchat? Okay. They Snapchat. I Snapchat. Um, I don't Snapchat. That's uh, right. She's young <laughs> <laughs> you have to learn about Snapchat before you're 30 to be somebody who's comfortable using Snapchat. This is what I've been told. Feel free to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we believe that in order to be successful, the FOSS movements need to be diverse and inclusive, bringing together a spectrum of people from different backgrounds and experiences. Yeah. Good. Uh, so here's some things that we're going to talk about. Uh, a little bit about why we care, why the two of us care about uh, ageism and technology, uh, what's going on with age and some solutions we'd like, things people have done or things we've seen uh, both inside of tech and outside of tech. So why do we care? This is your... Um, yeah, so, well, I kind of talked about that a little bit, but we care because we think software freedom is really important. Uh, and uh, it needs to be intersectional because there's a lot of different places that people could be using free software. Uh, and the problems that we solved in the last generation with copyleft licenses, um, patent pools, and all those kinds of things are not going to be the solutions that are going to be working on our technology in 20 years. But if we want to have software freedom in 20 years, then we're going to have to figure out how to pass the torch of the ideas so that new tools can be concocted. Uh, I Feel free to add. Yeah, I, I didn't run this by Deb, so sorry if this is surprising you. Um, Brett Smith recently wrote a blog post about the concept of third wave free software. Mm. Um, that uh, So you can look that up. Uh, it's like Brett Smith, third wave free software. Um, it should turn up. And he talks a bit about how like the ideas have kind of changed across generations and what the movement as a whole finds valuable has also changed, um, which is like a little way to contextualize this conversation. So in talking about uh, movement versus tools, like I said, we want the idea of user freedom uh, to persist even if the tools we like, you know, maybe our GPLv3 t-shirts will be sort of old news one day, but that's okay, we still care about software freedom. Uh, so one of the things that's really important to talk about, this is like a little bit of background when you're talking about free software, when you're talking about open source, is like the idea that there's a movement and there's a developmental model, there's a philosophy. The philosophy is this thing that drives the movement. The philosophy is something that enables a developmental model, right? So like there are all these wonderful things we say that you get out of like choosing open source licensing, there are all these corporate benefits of it, there are all these innovation tools. Alison Randall talks about this, that's kind of her specialty. Um, she's given some great keynotes on the topic, I recommend looking those up too. Um, like at Siegel? Like at Siegel, like at Siegel. Uh, and this is, you know, but all that is really made possible by the philosophy behind free software, this idea of openness and sharing and the moral imperative uh, to provide ownership rights to all the technology you interact with. And so uh, the collaborative software production and the uh, software freedom both happen to be served by public version control programming. So they sort of feed off of each other like yeast. So when you choose the correct tools, they end up um, facilitating the kinds of things that we want. So this is not to say that the tools aren't important, but that uh, if we choose the right tools, then we are promoting software freedom and, and, the, and those will evolve. Um, Oh, and including also like 
other great hippie stuff like uh, shared decision making, uh, transparency, um, consensus building. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that said, um, so we just talked a lot about tools and movement, but uh, when it comes down to it, all, all of open source is people. Um, free software is people. And uh, if you don't focus on the people, then uh, you've got like kind of zombies taking up space. Uh, like It's nice because now we pay people to work on free software, which is fantastic, but if they don't feel like they're part of the movement, they're just kind of sleepwalking through and pushing their changes up, they're not going to help us build the next generation of tools to protect user freedom. Cool. Um, diversity and inclusivity. Uh, the idea of constructing a movement or a group that has a wide range of ages uh, is based around this, this idea that you need to be diverse and you need to be inclusive. Uh, these things are a little bit different, but they relate to one another. Um, diversity jolts us into actions in ways that homogeneity simply does not. Uh, was this you, actually? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you had something to say here. Maybe. We uh, lost our oh, notes, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, the, the takeaway from this piece is that uh, people make better decisions when they are challenged by someone who is not like them. So if uh, if your organization is really homogeneous, then you sort of go for the lowest common denominator. Like, hey, I thought we just throw it out like this. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. But when you're presenting to someone that doesn't have all the same preconceptions and background that you do, you tend to work harder to be like, here's why I think this will work and why I think we want to avoid this situation and what I was using to uh, as a decision-making process to arrive at this particular solution that I'm pitching. So if you're pitching a solution to a team member that's not like you, then you tend to try and think a little bit harder about like, oh, what do I know that they don't know so that then I can take my argument a little bit bigger and propose a solution that's a little bit more um, complete and saying like, here's like where I started from and then this is why I'm proposing this. Whereas if you assume everyone in the room has basically your same experience and your same worldview, then you can just kind of like lowball it like, oh yeah, let's just throw it over here. Like, and everyone's like, yeah, okay. So uh, homogeneity uh, leads to laziness. Yeah. So, um, and then this is another piece about, uh, so we talked about diversity, homogeneity leading to laziness, but inclusivity means that you actually have to bring people in. It's not enough to uh, tokenize people and be like, hey, cool, like, you're a lady, can you show up in our brochure picture day? Because that would be awesome. But then we're going to all bug out for the board meeting where we make all the real decisions and we don't need you for that. So like tokenism doesn't really give you the benefits of diversity. Uh, this shouldn't really be news, and yet uh, organizations do it all the time. And they, they put a lot of different excuses in place why they do it, um, but somehow they seem to always manage to forget to invite the people that are not like them to decision-making conversations. And so uh, that said, so the challenge with diversity is to modulate the behavior, not just like what's written on paper, so that you're actually accepting new people that are not like you into your organization with open arms. Uh, maybe not actually hugging them unless they're cool with that. So this is like maybe metaphorical open arms. You can ask people if they like hugs. It's a good starting point. I don't know if it's like a, the best no, opening. No. <laughs> like, okay. But you know, do, do you shake? Do you hug? Yeah, okay, yeah. You know what we mean. Don't touch people if they don't want to be touched. Uh, again, <laughs> uh, in the category of we shouldn't have to say this out loud, and yet. Um, but uh, so we're... Uh, this means like asking questions and listening to people and saying like, how is this working for you? Like, um, are you feeling like you're part of this conversation? So that you make sure that um, people are not just taking up space and looking nice in your brochure picture where you show off how diverse you are. Um, so uh, another way to think of this is shared power. So. If there is an invisible barrier to power in your organization, in your project, it will eventually become obvious. Like, if, if like the actual decision makers in your project all go out drinking on Friday and discuss everything and then come in with a whole bunch of new stuff on Monday morning, people will figure it out. It'll only take a week or two before they're like, oh, 
you guys all talked about this on Friday without the rest of us and made a bunch of decisions. So, uh, you know, it's it's going to become obvious when people are going are being excluded. So you want to think of this like really as sharing the power within your organization. And it's great because delegating is, is awesome. It means less work for you. And then I think we're over to you. Yeah, it is. I'm going to talk about intersectionality and minorities in tech. Who is a minority in tech? Lots of people. Here are some examples of just some of the people who are minorities in tech. This photo is from the Women in Color in Women of Color in Tech chat. Uh, it's a project somewhere um, about women of color in tech. One of the great projects that they did was doing creating a bunch of stock photos. So you see licensed stock photos uh, for use in your marketing materials um, because while tokenism isn't great, you still do need to have you need to come up with good methods for displaying diversity um, and communicating that you are open to it or welcome to it or have diverse locate like have diverse spaces uh, because people are also more inclined to show up if they know somebody there is going to look like them uh, so this 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 person is also a minority in tech I, this is one of my favorite photos because she's just like an evil hacker like, look at her. I know I feel like she's DDoSing AARP or something yeah, oh yeah totally uh, I love this I love this photo um, uh, age, age is another group where we really do talk about minorities in tech, um, and it's becoming a much more common topic now than it was before. Um, here's like a very incomplete list of some people who might be considered minorities in technology, um, and within free software especially. These are the terms that we came up with after reading some stuff on the internet. Uh, if you know better terms, please tell us. Like, we don't identify as being members of most of these categories. For example, I have a degree, so I am not a non-college grad. I am also white, so I don't fit into either any of the race ethnicity categories. Uh, but, but diversity actually uh, is, is like a very localized thing um, that you need to think about on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so it could be gender diversity, it could be racial diversity, it could also be socioeconomic or background diversity. Uh, and while those things do include age, they also include stuff like well, did your parents go to college? Like, did you grow up in a trailer? Did you grow up in a city? Did you grow up in a middle class house? Um, uh, and these are like, these are actually like really important things to think about when you're considering language in the spaces you're building. Um, intersectionality is, is acknowledging that we have these mindsets and these institutional policies that create spaces where it is not okay to be diverse, that create spaces where there is homophobia and racism and sexism, uh, and that also most people who are somehow a minority aren't just a minority in one particular dimension. Um, so when you're thinking about diversity, like diversity is kind of this thing you can have, but until you have intersectionality, until you have inclusion, until you have people putting a lot of extra efforts into not just getting representation, but making sure that representation is acknowledged, uh, you're not gonna have any progress forward. Um, so uh, oppressive institutions are interconnected, uh, but sometimes we still need to talk about things separately, right? So the things that lead to racism are the things that lead to homophobia, are the same things that re re lead to ageism. Uh, and it's great, we need to acknowledge that they all exist, um, but sometimes it's really useful to kind of just talk about one of these particular points rather than everything at once. Uh, so this is our moment to say, yes, like technology is also awful to queer people, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. So what, what is going on with AIDS? Um, uh, tech has an AIDS problem. So this is, oh, you this had this me. quote. Oh, I had the other one. I had the other one. Yeah, you had yeah. the other one. This is me. It's okay. Uh, I, uh, tech has a huge AIDS problem. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg says, I'm reading these for the audio recording sake, or if anybody has trouble seeing, now you can know what the slide says. Uh, I want to stress <coughs> the importance of being young and technical. <coughs> young people are just smarter. Why are most chess masters under 30? I don't know. Young people just have simpler lives. We may not own a car. We may not have a family. Simplicity in life allows you to focus on what's important. Mark Zuckerberg, 2007, age 22 to 23. Uh, I don't know if Mark Zuckerberg still thinks this is true. Uh, if anybody has the opportunity to ask him, please hold him accountable for this question. Yes. You know, it's interesting that that said, um, I'm observing an opposite effect on age where there's an assumption that Young people know about computers better. They lend it to that so social environment where it may or may not actually be true. Yes. 
So you have the reverse of that also happening at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let's um. We we're gonna get into some of the differences between old and young. So uh, we'll we'll get into the commentary and questions yeah. at the end. Um, but the the value of this is, is that there's this this mindset in tech, especially that like there's something special about younger people, and that like these younger people, at least Mark Zuckerberg at age 22 or 23 in 2007, uh, had about who had the ideas, who had the intelligence. Um, however, uh, you know, it actually wasn't just young people who thought old people were boring. Um, sometimes older people thought older people were boring. Uh, but <laughs> They're doing it wrong. Is uh, he's a? I think he's a venture capitalist, um, and he said people under thirty-five are the people who make change happen, and older entrepreneurs fail to innovate because they are falling back on old habits. Um, so it turns out that really just everybody thinks young people know what's up. Uh, I don't know if they've ever met anybody under 35. I'm under 35. <laughs> oh, I guess I am young still. I told you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, th this, is, this is an institutional problem, right? Um, in 2011, uh, Google had a multi-million dollar settlement with Brian Reed. Um, Reed had been fired from Google, and he called ageism uh, as the reason for his being fired. He uh, he'd been like basically uh, insulted uh, mm -hmm. by people on his team, including his manager who was younger than him. Uh, they used words like he was obsolete or he was sluggish and old fuddy-duddy. His ideas were too old to matter. Um, and this is like this this kind of thing is, is not unique to Google. Um, and the general mentality of who you're looking to for ideas and whose ideas you're valuing in technology. Uh, aren't unique to this particular case. You'll see a lot of job postings that emphasize things like new grads or young rock stars or like free think, like up and coming thinkers or radical thinkers, uh, like fresh entrepreneurs. This kind of language is like really communicating that there's this, this big base idea that youth is where you're getting kind of these new mentalities. Um, also, like, um, and kind of a little bit on the legal side is, um, you know, uh, companies, including Google, have put the phrase they're looking for new grads in different job descriptions rather than focusing on things just like junior developers, um, which is also like pretty explicitly ageist. Uh, you might think it seems welcoming, like, oh, a new grad kid is welcome to apply to this job too, and it says so right away. I don't need to scroll down until I see the, the requirements of experience. Um, but what's also happening with that is you're saying that like, people who are older uh, aren't really welcome to it. And also, actually, people who didn't go to college but still might have those skills aren't welcome. Uh, here's a little bit about median ages. These are from payscale.com from 2012. I assume these have changed. Uh, I don't really know. The median age of a Facebook employee at the time was 26. Uh, the median age of an HP employee at the time was 39. Um, there's also, so uh, I don't, I'm going to skip slide. Uh, OK, no. Um, so uh, I don't have the numbers here. I'm really oh. sorry, but I cross-referenced uh, this. HP employees work 7.5 hours a day, while uh, Facebook employees work 9 to 10 hours a day. Yes. Uh, that, those numbers were, I think, from uh, We found that on, a, like, a glass door or something, yeah, talking about people's door. experience working there. Uh, so there's, there's like, a, a very strong correlation uh, between median age of employees and the number of hours worked. The older people are, the fewer hours they work. Uh, I make Ooh. assumptions that this is things like, well, if you're older, you have different kinds of responsibilities outside of work. Uh, but there's actually a whole other conversation about the concept younger people have about their duties in the office, which we'll get to a little bit later, and I'm happy to talk about more outside of this. So uh, the way we treat older and younger people in our communities is different based on age. And a lot of this has to do with uh, ideas around culture fit. Um, but uh, and the assumptions of like very young people and, and older workers is pretty different. So, but we're going to talk about young people first. Um, so uh, younger people is kind of a wide breadth here. We're using it uh, in this instance to talk to people who aren't yet college graduates or um, or aren't yet of working age. And uh, we uh, we put the Kool Aid up because we want these people to drink the Kool Aid. But we are having trouble getting a hold of them because uh, a lot of the norms in our communities aren't very welcoming to uh, people who uh, aren't drinking age yet. Hey, cool teenage kids. <laughs> what was the Steve Buscemi quote? The what? Steve Buscemi did this. Hi, fellow. Was that good? Yeah, hi, fellow you. Yeah. Oh, is that not from Trees Lounge? I don't know. That is another Steve age Buscemi. problem. That's all I know. Okay. Um, 
So, uh, and so Silicon Valley, like we talked about, the recent grads welcome to apply class of twenty seventeen uh, preferred, and those kinds of things. And uh, you know, we we think the reason for this is that they can set expectations of long hours where you sleep at the office. They take care of like all of your stuff, like laundry, um, food, all of your other things, so that you can just go in and work like ten or twelve hours a day. Um, this isn't uh, great for people, period, but it's also not great for folks having time to volunteer and work on free software projects. Um, and so, um, you know, this, uh, this means they might even be participating in like an open source project, but not like even being aware that that's what they're doing because it's, I mean, it's hard to think about the big picture when you are sleeping at work. Uh, so to kind of digress for a quick second, um, there, there are two themes sort of running through this talk. Uh, one of them is that overall tech has an age problem, and as an aside, part of that is free software has an age problem. But also the way that tech culture functions in the Mer in the U.S. right now, uh, and likely in another number of other places, creates environments and situations where people cannot participate in free software, and they can't participate actually just like in a whole number of activities outside of work. This is I yeah. think this is you. Yeah. So this is an ad uh, for Fiverr. Fiverr is a uh, what do they call it, like a marketplace, like a creative marketplace for young entrepreneurs. Uh, I don't really know what that means. I think it's a side hustle for your side hustle. It is. Uh, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's like for $5 or more, you can commission <laughs> someone to do a small single task, kind of a la Mechanical Turk, uh, but instead you approach people who are providing services. Um, and this is an advert of theirs uh, that was on the New York City Metro. Um, uh, you eat a coffee for lunch, you follow through on your follow through. Sleep deprivation is your drug of choice. You might be a doer. Fiverr might be for you. Um, she does not look like a person who considers sleep deprivation a drug of choice. <laughs> like she's pretty, where are the bags yeah. under her eyes? Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> a yeah, Very this soft. is fake. This is all yeah. fake. Yeah. Uh, somebody recently wrote a like a, a, an opinion piece somewhere. I think that was like, um, uh, "Sleep is the new status symbol," and that talks a little bit more about like the role, like what not sleeping, what sleeping, like how those fit into these conversations of uh, race, uh, not race, sorry, uh, socio like socioeconomic conversations. Um, one of the things that this is like really pulling at, though, is that there's an expectation of younger people, especially to just work obscene hours. Um, and that not only is it something that people do or that it's expected, it's something that's admirable, right? Like you like you want to be in the, I mean, I don't want to be in this club. I've been in this club. It's miserable. Never sleep, look like a supermodel. Uh, I don't know how to respond to that. Um, <laughs> it's fake. Don't do that. OK, good. Um, uh, so so th these, are, these are some numbers uh, from um, so the chart itself is from the unexpected reasons millennials skip vacations and become work martyrs uh, from Forbes.com. The numbers are from uh, like basically like the like U.S. Tr like travel uh, people who organize your trips for you, people who want you to take more vacations. So like take these numbers with a grain of salt. I couldn't find any information about like their sample size or who they talked to. Um, but uh, you know millennials actually just take less time off. Uh, than people who are baby boomers. I like how that's the dichotomy. No one cares about Gen X anymore. I'm really sorry, guys. Uh, I also learned that millennials are also called snake people, and I like that a lot. Snake people? Like Slytherin? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> snake people. Okay. Um, uh, and, and like, actually, so, so if you read all these reasons, which you can do on your own, the real takeaway is um, young people, especially, like, uh, are being put into these professional environments where they feel like they're not allowed to take time off. Like, it's a bad thing. You know, I'll speak from personal experience, like, in feeling as though I actually couldn't take vacation time for my job. And, like, even when I was on vacation, I was, like, on call or I needed to emphasize somehow that I was available. And it, I would get contacted. Um, what's great about this little article that this is from is uh, it's written to kind of imply that, like, oh, young people are, are creating this culture where no one can take time off, and it's so mean on their behalf to do that to us, uh, which I think also demonstrates the problem. Uh, but it, it turns out that really, like, 
millennials are doing this because they feel trapped and they feel like they need to do these things to not just justify their existence, but to like remain relevant. And not get fired. I think this is about, um, is that you? No. Uh, but, uh, well, so, uh, I guess this was, we're looking at, are, uh, are people under 24 contributing to free software? Um, and so, uh, so we have a birthday cake. I think, but you talked about most of it in the slide before. Yes, so, okay. sure. Good. Um, that's cool. Uh, and then this is Wesley oh, Crusher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> This is Wesley Crusher. Right, okay, yeah, I mixed up the slides, I got it. Thanks guys for your patience. Um, thank you Sorry, for your patience. Sorry, I didn't have the right version. It's okay. okay. Um, <laughs> roll with punches. Um, so how many, how many people in this room were con like contributing to free software or running free software uh, when you were in college or before you were in college? Okay, uh, so how many of you were doing it before you were in college? Just like keep your hands up. Okay, how many of you were doing it before you were in high school? Okay, wow, you guys are pretty good. Um, <laughs> so Wesley, like Wesley Crusher is kind of like the token example of this, this young person who's smart and brilliant and kind of annoying. He's that kid who shows up who's like there and he's like doing all the work and he's taking the leadership position when he's 16 and he's like the core developer for something by the time he's in college. And you know, he shows up to his first CS class that he has to take for some reason. And he's like, why yes, I do know regular expressions. Thank you very much. Um, at 11. At 11. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but but like, for him. <laughs> like this is like this is this is a unique person, right? This isn't most people uh, involved in the community. We have to acknowledge that actually most most people who are first showing up in general uh, don't know what's going on. They don't know what to do, and they're not as self like self. They're not as self motivated as like Wesley Crusher might have been. Um, uh, and actually, also most young people don't really know what they're doing. It turns out this is the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Um, uh, if you are a fan of the Harry Potter books or movies or know anything about them, you might be aware that uh, everyone on the Gryffindor Quidditch team has trained really hard at being good at Quidditch, and, and it's, this, it's the sport of wizards. You play it on broomsticks, you fly around. Uh, we can talk more about that later if you really want to know all my thoughts on Quidditch. Um, uh, you know, and they have all these hard regular trainings, and like many of them have been flying since they were young children on their broomsticks. Uh, and then like, this kid Harry Potter just shows up, and he's magically good at it, uh, having <laughs> never like known about magic before or played Quidditch or even known it was a sport till like basically he was like uh, drafted to the team. Um, and so what would you, uh, so like most people don't know what's going on and most young people don't know what's going on and most like young people also like aren't just like not good at things when they show up. And in fact, most people aren't really good at things when they show up. Uh, so they do need you to be patient and they need you to kind of take time and show them what's up and mentor them. Uh, and work hard, and they need to know it's okay to work hard. Uh, so one of the ways you can do this is by mentoring people, right? Uh, so sometimes you need someone to show up and like, you know, take you by the hand and tell you how your mother dresses you and you need to dress differently, or like help you have an identity because you don't <laughs> have a name with, you don't have an identity without a handle, uh, or like, you know, just really tell you when you're being universally stupid. Because um, those are hard things to like, just know on your own, especially when you're young. Uh, so mentorship and, and like being nice to these people and kind of helping new people and younger people along is how you turn them in, like how you turn the regular person who's not the cool self-starter who knows everything when they show up uh, into someone who's a valuable member of the community. Um, one of the, the big problems that younger people especially are having, ones who are already in technology but aren't involved in free software, is they're coming at it from using different tools, right? Uh, how many people in this room still use IRC? How many people in this room use Slack? Okay, and, and like HipChat? That's good, yeah. Um, uh, so using IRC, this doesn't come, this is the IRSSI logo. I use IRSSI and IRC. Um, somebody told me that makes me old and boring. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not using some cool hip thing. Um, uh, but but by ch it's good to acknowledge, I'm not saying don't use IRC, I love IRC, uh, but it's important to acknowledge that the tools you're using might not be the tools younger people are learning in school. It might not be the tools that like the hip tech companies are using. Um, so you're creating this kind of barrier to entry in terms of assumed technological skill that might not be something you're aware of. Um, 
Git and MediaWiki are also like subversion uh, is uh, another example of, of a thing people are using certainly less uh, as a background tool. Mm. So now we're going to talk about older folks. Um, so I spent some time last year looking at some of the assumptions and the cultural way that we think about uh, older people in technology, and in particular the way that older women on TV are portrayed. They're almost never portrayed in a technical capacity. Uh, I had a really hard time finding women over 40 that didn't like need help with their email on TV. It was kind of ridiculous. Um, I, uh, of, the, of the four women that I found that were portrayed as technical on TV, Two of them had aged up with their franchise, so like Lieutenant Uhura and uh, Samantha Carter from Stargate. So uh, like they started young, and then the franchise just kept going. <laughs> so like they happened to be over forty, but that's not the way they were cast. And then uh, there are two uh, more modern ones um, uh, who are women in tech, but they straddle this kind of management slash tech thing. They're not like the you know, the super lead hackers or like leading the team of coders in the dark. Um, they're kind of doing a little bit more of a den mother uh, role. And that was uh, Nina Sharp from Fringe. And then, uh, so you don't have to, I watched one episode of CSI Cyber with Patricia Arquette, um, <laughs> and who is over 40, technical, but on CSI Cyber. Uh, there, are, there are two other examples. I'm, I'm going to make the same mistake I made last time when I, I mentioned these. Uh, the nurse from Star Trek TOS later becomes a doctor. Uh, huh. I don't remember her name. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but um, so, so that's, I think that's an interesting one of somebody with like a technical or STEM skill set kind of like moving up in, not that being a nurse, like being a doctor is not the natural follow through of being a nurse, right? Uh, and that's like a bad mentality to kind of espouse. Uh, but it's this idea that there is a woman who is getting older and she's developing in her technical skill set. Um, also, uh, there's Criminal Minds, uh, oh. which is another uh, procedural uh, crime show. Um, and there's is that the lady with the ponytails? No, that's oh, okay. CIS, the, the goth, yeah. NCIS is yeah. the goth lady. Um, the... Anyway, yeah. I don't want. I don't want to say like yeah. it was hard to find many that people had heard of, and um, and my my point is that I think this uh, contributes to our mental image of what a older technical person looks like. If you look for examples of an older technical man, you find lots of them. It's a lot easier, um, but uh, it's a lot harder to find an example of that, and that contributes to this idea that. Uh, companies use when they're hiring of culture fit like they're always like oh, I didn't really picture someone that reminds me of my grandma running this team and it's like well that's on you actually or, or media so um, and this is a really interesting thing because there are a lot of companies that are desperate to find people with deep technical knowledge um, this is uh, I did some interviews while I was looking at this and she said you have to you know, you have to work really hard not to hire anyone over 30, but just about every startup in Silicon Valley manages to do it. There's another quote that I didn't put up here, but um, this woman said when she was, she was looking for a new company to work at, she could tell, like, sometimes she'd come in and, like, people would look and go, like, oh, yeah, like, weird, like, gross stuff like that. Like, oh, I'm not going to, could you interview her for me? Like, whatever type of thing. So, like... She she felt this real like oh we want we don't want you olden up the place, um, and so you know, and and a lot of women like right a lot of women decided that they're like you know what I'm gonna leave tech. There's this like oh what happens like women enter tech is it the pipeline I don't know if it's the pipeline they get in they leave after a couple years and everyone's like they're probably just having babies. They're not all having babies. A lot of them are just like, oh, I could go somewhere where my coworkers appreciate me and don't, like, you know, snicker or call me grandma. Like, basically, too old for this shit, right? So, um, this is another uh, interview quote. Now it's all about how I can experience, uh, use my experience to help other people work on their big important projects. So, this is uh, for some of the women who stay, they get pushed towards management. Like, could you mentor and den mother like the kids because they're working on real uh, exciting stuff and, you know, they need support. 
Um, and this, she was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not into that. I want to work on exciting stuff. So our next section is volunteering. Yeah. Um, free software is powered by volunteers. How many of you get paid to work on free software? <laughs> I'd say I get paid. To, I mean, I don't develop free software, but I get paid to work in free software. Yeah. Um, uh, most uh, free software is predominantly done by people who are volunteers. They're people who are doing it because they want to for whatever reason, and they're not getting paid for it. Um, so it's important to talk about volunteerism and like when you're thinking about getting people involved in projects. Um, volunteering is great. Uh, a lot of people do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Are my do I have numbers on these slides? Okay. Yeah. Volunteering is great. Uh, here's some useful stuff. Here are some numbers. Uh, uh, so most young, uh, more than half of young people, i.e. people between the ages of 12 and 18, are volunteering uh, for things. Um, they're putting in 29 hours per year, which when I first read that number, it didn't seem very impressive. Uh, but if I thought about it, it actually like does mean that these people are, are still getting out and doing stuff. Uh, how many of you volunteer outside of free software? Wow, you guys are great. <laughs> uh, how many of you like volunteer? Do you think like twenty hours a year or more? Oh yeah, yeah, nice. Um, uh, but a lot of uh, so a lot of these people are uh, participating in youth or religious organizations. Uh, so those are organizations that are like specifically put together to encourage like groups of young people to be like participating in volunteer activities. Um, the reason why youth volunteer is sort of all over the place. Uh, for some of them, it is part of this feeling of community. Uh, it's part of like a feeling of responsibility. It fits into like a church activity. Um, but it's also like actually required for a number of universities um, and colleges. Uh, it's, it's also required for a number of high schools uh, in order to graduate. Um, uh, so this was a, a quote I found uh, um, from an admissions counselor. Uh, talking about applications they were an admissions counselor at, I think, Yale, um, who described somebody as having volunteers 250 hours over the course of four years of high school as not impressive but laudable. So it was very nice. Uh, but the expectations of what it takes to get into like a fancy school, uh, like included in that is you're giving, you're going above and beyond everything else you're doing and you're giving your time. And that like 250 hours is like, it's nice. It's like good you helped people like mm -hmm. that, but it, it doesn't impress them. Like that's almost an expectation at that point. Um, retirees, on the other hand, uh, also volunteer a lot. Um, so like people on these these two spectrum ends, uh, you find the smallest number of, of people volunteering are the ones between like the ages of like when people are parenting. Yeah. Well. Yeah. When people are parenting. Uh, well, PTAs are like a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, but kind of dur during this like working gap, like the, the period where you'd be working. Um, so 42% of people over the age of 65 uh, volunteer, people are retirees. Um, and they're getting in way more hours. Um, there's still a lot of them in religious organizations. Uh, one of the metrics when people uh, who are studying volunteerism are talking about it is like talking about the efficacy of volunteers and, and like hours that people put in is how many people volunteer more than 500 hours over the course of the year. It's like 10 hours per week, about. Mm. Um, uh, so 10% of elderly volunteers, so 10% of 42% of people over the age of 42 account for the majority of the people volunteering over 500 hours a year. I hope that made sense. Um, uh, so, so like a lot of volunteer power uh, and a lot of volunteer potential uh, exists within these, these two outlying groups. Uh, here are some organizations that people volunteer for that, that are uh, like ones that we thought of as being particularly intergenerational. Mm -hmm. um, so you have religious organizations, you have, oh, sorry, uh, like uh, political campaigns. Uh, Habitat for Humanity is, is one group, like they structure activities specifically for families to go to volunteer. Um, they're very friendly for youth, they're very friendly for college students. Um, Girls Rock Campaign Boston is a nonprofit that Empowers uh, yeah. girls uh, to participate in being loud and trying new stuff, i.e. Mm -hmm. making a rock band for the week. And it's um, it's an all-female environment, and so the age range is pretty wide. It's from 8 to, mm -hmm. like, I don't know if anyone's actually 80 or not, but we definitely have, like, a, like retired nurses that volunteer mm -hmm. for the week. 
Um, so these are like so what these nonprofits are all doing is they're making spaces specifically for like intergenerational participation. They're reaching out to groups on like across the age spectrum uh, and creating these specific programs to get people involved regardless of how old they are. Uh, younger people and older people like to use their time for good. We should all take advantage of that. So some, uh, some places that we've noticed in the free software movement where people are doing a good job of bringing in different age groups other than, you know, kind of that 23 to 28 year old uh, white dude that doesn't need to sleep. Um, because he's some... already working so many hours that he doesn't <laughs> have time for free software. Yeah. So, uh, so we want to we we wanted to look at organizations that are doing a good job of passing the torch and being like, hey, let me tell you a little bit about like why we do this and what's going on here, and then uh, hopefully you can pass it on to the next generation. So, um, Penn Manor is a, a project. Uh, it's a high school where the kids run uh, the IT department basically. So they set up a bunch of laptops and computers and they run the computer center, they troubleshoot, they probably are on Linux questions every day, um, doing stuff like that. And, uh, and so it's getting them in early, helping their peers and it's, it's really great for the school and they're mm -hmm. doing all Red Hat stuff. Um, do you want to talk about yeah, that? Sure. Uh, so the, uh, more universities are developing programs, minors and centers for uh, free software and open source excellence, uh, leadership development and skills. Um, I recently got to visit a class, uh, a graduate class who uh, was a class on free software and like their capstone project for the course was submitting a contribution to a project. Um, there are things like Maker Days, there are cool games that like actually are free software that teach free software, uh, but also just like teach you the principles of free software. Um, and kids days at big conferences are super cool. Yes. Uh, so some of the great things that are happening to get older people involved. So Outreachy is an internship program similar to Google Summer of Code, except that Google Summer of Code is actually only for current college students or graduate students. Outreachy serves a lot of women who are returning to the workplace after having their uh, kids. And so, uh, so they're doing a lot of um, effort to get people in who are not just college students into like basically a paid internship to kind of freshen up their skill set or learn to program for the first time or learn to do something else. Uh, OpenSource.com is a, a, a news site where uh, a lot of the folks who write for OpenSource.com are older or are retired and they, they just like, they like learning about stuff and hearing what's going on. Um, and so it's a, it's a really good wide spectrum uh, generationally wise. Um, edX? Yeah, edX and Code Academy, there are a lot of online resources uh, for learning to code. Free software extends significantly beyond coding, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, they're like something uh, both of us can't drive enough as people who are predominantly non-coding contributors to free software is that you don't have to be able to code to do it. Um, and that is actually one of the points where, uh, in, like where uh, especially um, like older people are great contributors to projects because they'll come in having already developed excellent skill sets. Uh, there's like this, running events. Like running events. Uh, there's a uh, Italo whose last name I never remember. Vignoli. Vignoli. I just can't pronounce it. I'm scared to pronounce it. Italo Vignoli uh, is a marketing guy in Italy. He has an excellent like press uh, background, and he's like this amazing contributor who does no code. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you know, volunteering with community-run conferences is like another way people can get involved. Um, it's great with like if you have local knowledge. Uh, some of the excellent Linux Best Northwest volunteers are in here. Um, shameless plug for Outreachy. If you're interested in getting an Outreachy internet in your project, uh, either of us can hook you up with the right people to talk to. Uh, and then some of the other things that are not so super age specific. I think people know what these are. I'm gonna. Yeah. We're kind of short on the time, sure. so. Um, and then uh, some of the stuff we'd like to see happening is ways for kids to do more non-code stuff, uh, more places for older people to do non-code stuff, uh, more support for works, uh, moms who are returning to the workforce and not, not just outreachy. Outreachy is great, but there's only so many spots. Um, and uh, something we were thinking about, like what about youth or junior affinity groups within communities? And we'd love to see more all ages social events. Actually, this event does a really great job. The game night is a fantastic example. Um, so if you work on another conference and you don't have an all ages social, uh, maybe ask yourself why that is. Uh, so this is uh, this means we're getting to the end, and we have time for I don't know if we have time for questions or not. We but have oh, like we're scheduled before, before lunch. 
We're scheduled till twelve fifteen. Yeah. Twelve fifteen. We have oh. hella time. Oh, okay. Oh. Wait. So how am I? Okay. So I made us speed up a little. <laughs> uh, I thought we'll have more oh, yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. no. Uh, uh. Oh, okay. Um, never mind. I I don't know what time it is. Um, but we will get to talk about stuff. I think people wanted to talk. So um, so what our our call to action is to uh, find ways to bring people in that uh, don't look like you in your project, uh, especially if they're a lot older or a lot younger than what you already have going on. Uh, we talked about how diversity makes your project stronger, um, having to explain things to people who don't share all of your background and all of your uh, preset ideas about how things are done and how things should get done uh, makes you make better decisions. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm going to add that uh, doing that is a lot harder than just saying you're going to do it or like wanting to do it or even approaching it with good intentions. Um, there are lots of great resources out there. There are lots of great people out there who are willing to help you and talk with you about stuff. Um, Geek Feminism is a good resource. Uh, Opensource.com has been putting more things out as well. Um, but generally, actually, people are usually pretty open if you want to approach them and talk to them and say, like, hey, you know, I'd really like it if we could come up with some more stuff to get kids involved and then going to, like, somewhat, like, some high school people, for example, and saying, hey, like, what can we do? What would you be interested in? What would help you? Or talking to somebody who's older and saying like, hey, you know, we'd really like to create more spaces. Uh, what can we do with that? Um, one of the big things that I've seen be very successful um, is having alternating times for meetings, for example. Um, so uh, doing like, so if you have a meeting that's on a weekend and then if you have a meeting that's uh, in the middle of the workday and you're changing times, like not everybody's going to be able to go to all the meetings. But if every time you have a meeting, it's going to be Wednesday at 6 p.m., what this means is like people with kids won't probably won't be able to make it. Um, people who uh, work in certain environments won't be able to make it. People who are younger might not be able to make it. And then um, we also wanted to kind of reiterate to make sure that once you bring someone new in, you have to empower them to really be part of what is going on, part of the decision-making process. Uh, like real members of your community have access to important information. They get invited to the meeting where things actually happen. So it's not uh, enough to just kind of have people sort of scattered around. They have to like truly be on a path. You know, I'm not saying like someone shows up and five minutes later you're like, cool, you're the CEO now. Uh, which would be hilarious, but probably not super useful. But you do want to constantly be moving people towards a place where they have more knowledge and more responsibility to participate more fully in your project. And so you can't just either like, oh, I remember when you were 11. Like, you can't uh, keep people out once they've been around for a little while. Um, and um, you, I mean, if you want your project to grow, you empower people to be part of it, and then you get out of their way so they can be awesome and bring in uh, their own new people and their own uh, folks into your project or your movement or your uh, venture, whatever it is. Uh, and that's 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 the way that you you grow because you can't you can't grow if you do everything yourself. Do you, do you wanna or no? No, I think that's just stepping up. Okay. Oh no, there isn't. Okay. Uh, so, um, stepping up, stepping down. Uh, if you want to be involved in a project, you need to be able and willing uh, to step up when you see an opening to claim responsibility, to ask for spaces to speak, to ask for spaces to participate, to ask uh, for things you can do. Uh, at the same time, if you're already in these roles, uh, you need to be willing and happy uh, <coughs> making space for people to get involved. This is really hard, right? It's really scary to give up control. Uh, it's really scary to not be the most important person in the room anymore. And it's scary to like let things that you like to do go to somebody else. Um, so people who want to do more things need to be comfortable doing those things. This is really hard. It takes a lot of confidence. It takes a lot of empowerment. Uh, and then the people who are already in positions need to make space for them to move up into those roles. And usually that also means helping them do it, suggesting to them that they do it. Cool. OK. So. So this is, uh, we've been having this conversation for a little while. We want to have, we want to continue having this conversation. So we have this hashtag. Um, 
uh, that if you think of ideas or you think of stuff that uh, would be really awesome to help us build an all ages fast movement, you could share them with us on the Twitter. Yeah. Um, we also have email addresses and IRC names, but they're not in this. Yeah. Sorry. So, um, so then this is the part where we can talk, uh, do questions, or people can share their own stories about things that uh, they've seen that are really effective at building an all ages fast movement. Yeah. Oh. Awesome. Uh, is there a unique and more efficient way of working and collaborating coming from more inclusive groups? Is re is the new how? Okay. Um, uh, so this is actually uh, you you uh, maybe unintentionally made a really good point about uh, diversity and inclusivity and making good spaces, which is you really need yeah. to also take into account that different people have different needs. Uh, I'm a member of a group working on forming a neighborhood council in the area I live in. Uh, one of the people uh, who goes to the meetings regularly is hard of hearing, so we all have to stand up when we speak or she can't hear us talk. Um, so thinking about the kinds of ways you need to compensate to make spaces more approachable and efficient and effective uh, is really important. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't have super too much to add to that. I, yeah. I, I forget what the question was, I'm sorry. Wait, uh, does anyone remember the question? to like good ways to cre create like collaboration, um, like a single good way that people uh, like collaborate across projects. Uh, everybody does different things and a lot of it is trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, so things that are good uh, overall are uh, asynchronous communications is super useful. Uh, asynchronous communication is useful because it allows people to be able to like read and participate regardless of where they are and regardless of like where their time is available. Uh, but also their willingness to jump up in the middle of a conversation. Sometimes people, you may have been in one of those conversations where people get really passionate and then you realize there's a couple of people around the edges of the room or in the channel or on the call that are like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not, mm -hmm. I can't interrupt, I'm not going to jump in the middle for that. And so mm -hmm. asynchronous communication is really key for that because you can compose your thoughts and share them with the group without having to interrupt. Yeah, I have a, another talk that I've given about like the downside to asynchronous communication, which is email lists provide a certain type of uh, anonymity um, and like responsiveness and depersonalization that it, it also like leads to people just being jerks uh, more so than in some other ways. Uh, IRC meetings or internet meetings are also good. Uh, There's a couple of different ways to make sure that those are effective. Like uh, one is to make sure that people know what's going to be discussed in advance so that um, Otherwise, you end up with folks kind of like spitballing stuff that they just thought of and maybe they're like, oh, I remember I saw something on the internet about that like three years ago and it's like, eh, it's gone. But if you give people the agenda in advance, they can kind of like, oh, I have a link that I'm going to share with the group. Um, and then everyone is sort of prepared and no one gets blindsided by the topic. Uh, the other thing is uh, when you do those kinds of meetings to kind of um, – either have a part where you get like feedback from each person, like like let's go around the room, or uh, to facilitate meetings in a way where you say things like, oh, well, Molly hasn't said anything yet. Like, I wonder if she, or, you know, like, uh, I know Sarah has been looking into this topic and perhaps would like to add something here. Or like, you know, John, you held this event last year. Like, did you want to describe how you handled it at that time or whatever? So it's like there's, ways to facilitate to make sure that you don't have just sort of your uh, one or two or three, God help you, uh, alpha talkers running your whole meeting. For a long time, I was uh, pretty uncomfortable speaking up in groups like that or in like group conversations, especially synchronous ones. Um, and something that helped me a lot was knowing that there was somebody there who I could like feed my idea to in the first place uh, and then have them say to me like, no, no, you should mention that. Like you should tell everybody about that. Um, so making sure that there's clear space and like that you repeat it to people. Oh, well, you know, you can email me personally too, as well as just like contacting the list about it or like feel free to message me like in a private channel if you have any specific questions um, because that is another one of those ways that you can like help create space uh, for more people to talk. 
uh, like the biggest thing here is there's lots of different stuff people do to collaborate. There are like lots of tools uh, to keep track of things. There are like lots of different methods of uh, like just methods of holding meetings. Um, and you have to be willing to try different things to see what works for your community. Um, where I'm working right now, one of the best things about our meetings is we have a space in the mall to like talk about process where we can say, okay, you know, we have these final five minutes. Uh, is every, like, is there something new that we should try? Is there something that's not working for someone? Um, what can we do to like make these meetings more efficient? Uh, like one of my favorite things that has come out of that uh, or like that kind of idea was um, uh, I'm on the open source initiative board and at OSI board meetings after somebody like makes a proposal we have to wait three seconds and count them before like we move into any decision making to give people an opportunity to like go like oh no actually I want to respond to that yeah so. that's also good um, over here and then friends is it okay to mention some good ways to help uh, bridge those page gaps. Yeah. yeah. So there's a uh, website called tealsk12.org, which is a group of a listing of schools in your area where you can go and walk in and help uh, kids learn about computers. So like this is thing in the Ooh. CS labs. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's anything equivalent here. I'm from Georgia. Uh, the lower to uh, lower half of the state, approximately two thirds of the high schools don't even have computer science mm -hmm. uh, classes. Um, and so there's there's a project there called Project Rise Up, which um, they try to help, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, there's teachers are just, you know, incapable of, of providing those classes. So, so their focus is try to go into these socio, you know, economic depressed areas and, um, and try to like, you know, bring computer science there. L luckily, <coughs> the, <coughs> sorry, the uh, AP C, uh, CS classes you can take online, mm -hmm. um, but most of the schools don't even know it. So there may be other opportunities to try to you know engage mm -hmm. remotely or try to bring these things to um, you know areas that they don't have. And I, and I feel like having that interaction. Um, I'm I'm over 35, so I'm old, I guess. Um, but with, with younger kids, it's okay, it's not bad. before they get colluded by uh, you know college and. And startups and, and all of those ideas. Um, I think it's a really good opportunity to try to uh, help mentor people. So. What was the website you said at the top? <laughs> um, teals, like the color teal, S K twelve, like pearl teals, I guess. K twelve, like the number. Yes. Dot. Dot org. Or. Um. Uh, cool. Do you have more to say on that? Or I haven't done it yet. Yeah. I'm hoping to sign up for next year. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a, a shameless plug right now. There's also Floss Desk Desktops for Kids, which is a like kids build and refurbish completely free computers. Um, that's run out of small Albany, Albany, New York. Sorry. Um, um, but they we have a friend you lose there and calls it small Albany. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and, but they have good documentation uh, around how to do that. Um, the uh, the AARP actually does a lot of funding for technology. Um, I know that they helped fund OLPC. <coughs> Uh, for at least part of its time. I don't know if they still are. They give money to the Media Lab. Um, so there are like people looking at these things and resources being developed uh, around that. Um, there are a lot of like technical issues uh, that we don't always talk about. Um, one thing, for example, is that uh, I learned as you get older, your, what, your skin holds moisture not as well, so certain time, kinds of touch screens don't work as well for you anymore because the currents can't move across your like your fingertips as well. <sighs> Technology! <laughs> uh, Francois. Yeah, so um, it, it's clear that in the workplace, especially the tech workplace, there are some ages and then age mm -hmm. discrimination. Yeah. And, and you see by looking at all the numbers. But in the open source world where a lot of the um, the volunteer aspect already, because of course it's open source written by professionals and that becomes a workplace open source. But in the volunteer open source where yeah. people collaborate already in IRC over Slack, and there's quite a bit of anonymity. Anonymity. Yeah, it's hard work. <laughs> 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 um, uh, already. Um, <coughs> do you think there's an ageism issue in the open source world today? In, in the yeah. boards that you mentioned that you're a member of an OSI yeah. board, do you see ages in there? Actually, the OSI board is the most age-diverse group I have ever participated, well, 
one of actually no it is the most age diverse group i'm also a volunteer at the arnold arboretum in boston um and i'm the youngest volunteer there by i think like two or three decades um so that's actually not that diverse but they do slant significantly older uh, the osi board is incredibly diverse i think the oldest member is in their 70s uh and the youngest member is in their mid-20s um so that's like really incredible uh we're also incredibly white um and uh we're doing okay uh, in like binary gender diversity, but like we're not great at it. Um, and it's also binary gender diversity. Uh, so like, yeah, I would say also too, a lot of software projects tend to, it's not that they, uh, they tend to just be sort of homogenous. Some of the smaller ones, like, uh, you know, I, I've, I've worked with a lot of, um, like so we're a GNU project we're connected to a lot of other older projects and um uh they they just actually never really thought about like how would we get more people in period like of any age so they are sort of like locked in time with whoever they went to grad school with so like whatever that age is is the one that like they're really good at and everything else is like I don't know um I mean I, I, I've some of that that's it's complicated it's not necessarily like oh young people we don't want them it's like it's a it's a little bit of a skill if you haven't if you don't have like sort of a default open door policy for your project to figure out how to delegate so a lot of projects are just like oh well I would love to delegate except like I can't find anyone who's worthy enough and it's like no 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 you're not looking for a clone of yourself like you're looking for someone who could take like maybe five or ten percent of what you're doing off your plate and then grow them into like someone who could do more you can't go out into you know and find someone with like your 10 20 30 years of experience to delegate to because usually someone at that level already has their own stuff they're working on they don't need to like come and help you by letting you give them the stuff you don't want to do so so it's it's not I don't it's it's not always ageism but it is sort of this like well what's a 25 year old gonna know how to do and it's like well certainly not the same stuff as you at 55 but like you could find a way to break off a piece of what you're doing and that would help you know that would help you pass the torch it can't be like you don't just like turn 25 year olds into 55 year olds and then you're like great awesome now you have 30 years of cs experience and i feel comfortable delegating to you like it doesn't it doesn't work like that so um yeah. in the back from you. how does accessibility fit into your <laughs> model uh well we we haven't talked a lot about accessibility i like talking about accessibility though uh i'm not a specialist in it um so uh Thinking about accessibility is a very broad issue right now. Um, uh, so there, are, like, there are technical problems, and then there are technical solutions, and there are social problems, and there are social solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, free software has a really beautiful opportunity to lead the way in what it means to be actually accessible technology, um, because so uh, the American Disabilities Act has a lot of like very good standards around what's required. But it's also very easy to meet the minimum of those standards and not like actually create technology and tools that are, are useful. Um, so, uh, so like as a movement, because of like the models that are enabled by choosing and using free software licenses and developing and like building communities around projects and tools, uh, like we can make wonderful, excellent things, and, and it's up to us to step up and do that. Um, uh, to like be a little bit more specific. When you're dealing with locations, there are concerns about like location development creating like something that big conferences sometimes do is they create lanes for like people in wheelchairs um, or people who like need assistance walking. Um, like using generally like <coughs> locations that are in general accessible is a really big deal, um, and mm -hmm. especially if it's not like well you know the bar that we're use, like, having the party at, you can get into, but you need to like call before you get there so that they can open up the elevator from the other place. Like that's not a good choice. Um, Sometimes uh, venues don't, if it's smaller, you, they don't even know if they're accessible. Like, yeah. so I've called um, places and said like, oh, are you accessible? And they're like, yeah, 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 we're on the first floor. And I'm like, 
does how wide is the door to the bathroom and is it on that first floor not like a, a couple steps and they're like oh uh and it's like oh you don't even know like you've got the bar in there on the side but you don't actually know if someone could get in there with a wheelchair mm -hmm. it's like kind of a if you if it's not your challenge sometimes people don't think of it yeah. and so um yeah, I, I, uh, I feel like there is a good list somewhere of um, ways to make your events, your in-person events, more physically accessible, and I can't, I'm blanking on what that link is, so. I don't know. Um, when it comes to things like meetings, like phone meetings, for example, is having a, like, preset wait time, like saying we're going to, like, give three seconds, but, like, mm -hmm. between, a, like, somebody finishing something and making a decision, uh, plenty of people have trouble speaking. Um, uh, developing other kinds of tools or systems that work for your collaborations um, and I can't think of a lot off the top of my head I'm really sorry uh, to take advantage of like to, to accomplish things that like the individual needs of your community are there one of the biggest things you can really do is just like say repeatedly and publicly like this is what we do now it's like we're flexible like come and talk with us about your needs and we'll figure out a way to make it work. Right, so someone may say, oh, it would really help me if you didn't send that in such and such format because yeah. then I can put it in my own assistive technologies. And so yeah. just being open to doing that, but also putting out there that you're open to doing that yeah. so that people don't feel like, you know, like, oh, yeah, you just talked about how busy you are and I feel really bad asking you to accommodate me. So, it's, you know, you got to make sure that you're, uh, overcoming people's like innate yeah. assumptions that they're being bothersome. Oh, and it's it's also it's okay to also then say here's a change we made because then you can point to it in the future and make people know that it's like you're letting people know that you're interested in what they have to say and you're interested in adapting for their needs. Mm -hmm. I had a hand in the back, yeah. Yeah, in the back. So wow, uh, there's so much in this talk. <laughs> Oh, oh, well, you're definitely not saying that. That, well, that was more that some women don't want to do that, and they feel pressured. Oh, welcome to the club. Tell me about it. Yeah, that's, but some women do, and that's that's also fine. Like, that's yeah. that's what that's what feminism is supposed to be. Yeah. We all get to pick. For me, this has been a fabulous year because I've intentionally taken some time to contribute to putting out these both projects just to get back into doing more coding and more coding next to design, uh, which is my specialty. Um, but...
uh, approach it from an uh, aspect of community practice. Uh, uh, it, what you describe is not just uh, uh, tailored to this environment. It's a it's the same systemic problem that you run into any industry, regardless if it's open source or building airplanes or the military or uh, if you're in the water basket weaving. Doesn't make a difference. Um, what you're what you are proud creating a community of practice, allowing voices to eat to be equal. Uh, you're leveraging the diversity of thought, regardless of background. And I think the techniques that you brought up there, the three second rule. Little yeah. techniques like that help keep the community practice alive and respectful all the way across. Uh, some of the brightest people I ever worked with were the ones that didn't say anything because the three second rule wasn't there. Yeah. So uh, give that a chance. It's, a, it's not a new concept, but it's one that's been written up more recently uh, to approach to uh, problem solving. Mm -hmm. I would also say that if you've got if you've got a problem or a like a task that needs doing in your community that no one is doing, uh, it's it's not always easy to just because you're volunteering maybe on a free software project doesn't mean that other people want to volunteer their time. Like some things you may decide as a community, like oh we should crowdfund this or pay for this. Design might be one of those things. I've noticed that most people hate doing taxes for projects. That might be another thing. Well, I think also too, like uh, sometimes uh, it behooves you to sit down with like one person and say like, here's what I think we want because uh, I've had this uh, happen to me as a consultant where uh, like an organization has said like, oh, we need a fundraising consultant. And what they actually needed was like six different things, the end goal of which would have been fundraising. But if they had asked someone at the beginning, it would have been like, no, first you need someone to put your stuff in a database and then you need this and then this and then and then you need a fundraising consultant so sometimes if it's an uh really far outside of your coding work uh it's not it's not just as easy as saying like oh we want this end goal you might need to bring someone in to say like how should we structure this process because you may not come up with it by yourselves if it's not your expertise They're not always good, though. Um, it's uh, yeah. So for for me, the way I sort of approach those kinds of things is like I find a friend or a friend of a friend, and I'm like, please let me buy you lunch, and then tell me like how far off base we are with this idea where we have someone come in and do three hours of design work, and our website's amazing. Like, okay, they'll come and they'll tell you know you're buying them lunch. I think it's it's worth doing, and they'll be like three hours. <laughs> And then you can go back to your group and say like, okay, so what we're actually looking for is something more like 30 or 300 or whatever it is. And so I, I think it's okay to say like, I'm not sure if we know what we don't know. I'm going to take someone to lunch who works in this area and figure out like what we don't know. Generally, uh, a lot of projects do pretty well in asking, like in soliciting specific like solutions, just like to specific issues. Um, so uh, one of my like, favorite examples of this right now is Red Hat has an outreachy project that's like make a coloring book to teach version control or something like that. Um, uh, so like being very specific and like soliciting uh, like needs is really helpful. Um, uh, since you know more about design than I do, I'm like happy to default to you on like designers want to build their portfolios. Um, like my contrast to my experience, like my contrasting experience to that is, uh, like plenty of people do want to build their portfolios, but they also like when tasks are of a certain size, they don't want to do them if they're not getting paid for them. Yeah, everybody's still got to eat. Yeah, over here. I'd say a thing I run into. I work on an open source project that several universities work on, and a 
challenge you run into is it's there's a big hurdle just in terms of being able to make an initial impact in terms of the number of things you want to learn. And then when people make contributions, it can often take two or three months for those people to get feedback. And so what I, what I don't know is how many people are we losing just because that barrier is so high and the feedback loop, you know, we, we don't know who we lose. We only know the people who, who we get. stick around and persist. There's, there's a whole, that, uh, and I've actually done a whole talk on how you delegate so that you don't end up like, uh, uh, it, I would say a lot of it comes down to having your first task as a, for new contributors be like this big when it should be like, hey, I could go in and fix this typo, but it would be awesome to let someone who doesn't know how our project works take this bug, learn how to check out our repository, figure out how to navigate to that place, figure out a tool to open that file with, fix that typo, close it, save it, put it back in the repository, and append a message that lets someone know what it is. So instead of like, oh, I've spent like 19 hours working on a giant patch, and I've never contributed to your community before, could you look at this 200 lines of code? It could be like, oh, actually, could you could you start with one line fix so that we can make sure that you're like even using the right repository or whatever? Um, and that you understand like how our process works. So I would say that uh, projects that have that kind of a backlog of like, oh, we don't get to respond to new contributors for two or three months are, um, are letting them put in something that's too big and too difficult to review for their first patch. And so it should be this big for their first patch. Um, there's also um, the Twisted community does something. so. Um, if, if you attach glory to writing your own lines of code but not to reviewing patches, then everyone will want to write their own code and not review patches. So the Twisted community has done this uh, gamification thing where you got like some certain number of like one to one points for writing lines of code or submitting patches, but you got like some kind of like 10 time bonus for uh, reviewing somebody else's patches and it was on this like kind of arcade game style leaderboard. So all of a sudden everyone's like, ooh, ooh, new patch, I got this one. Get off, get, no, I'm doing this one. Like, wait, I told them I would. Like, well, you're gonna have to just wait for the next patch to review. And so it created, once you make it valuable and laudable and all the glory comes to patch reviewers, people do it. Um, so that, that's another idea. I just, I just like glory to patch reviewers. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Twisted does this. I mean, they may not do it anymore. They were doing it for a long time, and they may have gotten that regularized where people are like, oh, yes, we know it's cool to review patches. But yeah. um, they had, like, a like a significant backlog, and then they did this gamification thing, and then all of a sudden, like, the patches were getting reviewed the day they came in. Uh, valuable conversations, like, for community building and contribution in general are, like, a very important one is why are people interested in your project? Why do they want to contribute to your project? Um, and like, if they're there because they just like want to participate in something and they think the community is super cool, the things that they need or will be interested in doing are very, very different than they than like if they're there because they are using your so like using this piece of software at work and they need these changes to be made to it regularly or they're updating it for their like own use. Um, just different than like if you're participating in something because you think the project itself like is very valuable and you're like basically just helping altruistically and that's different than if you're getting paid to work on it. Mm -hmm. um, so what people need is just like it varies. Sorry to keep asking, but was there something <coughs> Googleable where I can find Twisted? Uh, Twisted so is like, uh, Twisted yeah, Matrix, uh, yeah, yeah, Twisted Matrix. It's uh, yeah, it's a Python uh, scripts backlog stuff. Yeah. Is it a transparency <laughs> project? Twisted? Maybe. We have so many now, I can't keep track. Um, but yeah. Uh, any other questions before? I, I think it's okay to let folks go a couple yeah, minutes early for lunch. Leave but, you, want. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, so we'll take one in the back and then people can come <coughs> up and ask us individually yeah. stuff. Another thing I kind of, I'm kind of more of a suggestion. Yeah. 
No, that's a great point. Codes of conduct are is another way to say up front, like, no, really, we want everyone. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I agree. For more on codes of conduct, <laughs> see the other talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, FOSS, Des it's, it's FOSS Desktops for Kids, Pat Masson runs it. It's an open source initiative incubator project. Hmm. Just in um, I, think th I think somebody else has started one elsewhere. Um, I think we should let people yeah, know. Yeah. And then if, if you have a question you didn't get to ask in front of the group, you can come up. Yeah. But thank you so much for coming. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Adam. Uh, Flosk Desktops for Kids, Open Source Initiative, Pat Masson, two, two S's. Um, those are the keywords.